Namaste, a very warm welcome to all of you on today's episode of NTUC's Liver Dialogue. My name is Sama Thapa. I'm your host for today's episode. It's often said workers' rights should be a central focus for development. The labor movement has a very vital role in any nation's socio-economic and political transformation. If we look at the global history, the labor movement has always transferred misery and despair into hope and progress. Talking about Nepali context, the Biratnagar labor movement that began in 2003 BS played a very significant role in ending 104 years long autocratic Rana regime. Nepali workers have always played a crucial role in political transformation, but often their sacrifices and contribution goes unheard and unseen. Although these working class groups sacrifice to bring the changes in the system we are enjoying today, why does the situation of these working class people remain the same? This question needs a fair answer. So today in NTUC's dialogue, we will be talking about the situation of working class people, the challenges and way forward, and also some international and national labor movement context will be highlighted. To talk more on this, I'm joined by Dr. Richard Howard, Director, ILO Nepal Office, and also we have Lakshman Basnet, General Secretary, South Asian Regional Trade Union Council. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, to begin with, I go with Lakshman sir. Can you please tell us more about the Nepali labor movement, a brief history and today's context? Where are we? The Nepali labor movement started with uh, in a small factory mm -hmm. uh, which has about 35,000 workers mm -hmm. and it sought for social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time the country was ruled by the Ranas mm -hmm. and there was no justice in the society or even for the workers. So they wanted the justice, social justice mm -hmm. that means a good working condition, mm. a decent work, in today's term, decent work, full paid worker, mm. and uh, education, health, and chance to up, go upward. Mm -hmm. So it turned into a strike, and then it uh, went on for a political movement. Mm. That means uh, that paved the way. That was the first organized strike in Nepal under Rana regime. And that paved the way for a people's movement in 2007, uh, Nepali date, uh, that is 1947. Uh, but the, st uh, the movement started at 1949. So it's, this is uh, uh, happening in 1947. Mm -hmm. His leader was G.P. Koirala. He later became Prime Minister of the country. And uh, uh, eight years later, there was labor law mm -hmm. when the first ministry of B.P. Koirala uh, came into power after a general election. And social protection was there, mm -hmm. provident fund, pension schemes, working hours was, were fixed much more uh, respect for the worker was given at that time. That's what the workers need, respect for their job, whatever they do. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, unfortunately, it didn't last more than 18 months. Mm -hmm. Then again, it went back to the same position. So, in last 75 years, workers have been struggling and uh, again going back to the same position then again struggling and uh, this is, is the same thing is happening in this period also mm. thank you so i move on to richard mm. uh, the workers and their issues are always a primary concern for ilo so from ilo's perspective how do you view the nepali labor movement how do you see the movement going I think uh, in many ways the Nepali labor movement is more advanced than other countries in mm -hmm. South Asia. Uh, I think one of the unique things about Nepali labor movement is how well 
the unions work together across different lines. And there is a joint committee in the country, mm. JTUCC, and this committee comes together on key labor issues. And they're able to negotiate on things such as the labor law, the contents of the law, uh, social protection, the basic rights of workers. They come together. So mm. despite political differences that are, you know, pervasive in any country, mm -hmm. the labor mo movement in Nepal is unique because people, those workers, those representatives come together in a unified way and put what's best for workers first as mm -hmm. a fundamental right. I think it's a good lesson for uh, many institutions in the country. Despite such glorious history, do you see things prospering as it should? Well, because I mean, we have such a yeah. glorious history of labor movement here in Nepal. Yeah, glorious history, but also glorious challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not easy actually to progress the rights of workers in a country that's developing mm -hmm. because you always have this argument from enterprises, from government, that we have to put growth first, GDP growth first. You know, enterprises have to grow and prosper and then we'll look at workers when we're ready. Mm -hmm. But you can't really have growth unless you take care of workers at early at all stages of development and that's why an organized trade unionist movement is so important so we invest in workers and their wages and their health and their safety and the, the education of their families and take care of them when they grow older and when you do that you actually see you have greater productivity in the country mm -hmm. and more growth so it's not an either or scenario but it's important in all labor movements that workers, employers, government come together, mm -hmm. think of uh, the different needs of those three constituents and, and negotiate solutions that work for all three. And that, that's difficult. That's what makes a labor movement move, mm -hmm. is this consensus that, that you form through dialogue. And that, that's where what really makes or breaks our success in Nepal. As we are talking about history, after the late Giriza Prasad Kwerala, you led the Nepal uh, Trade Union Congress since 2047 or 48. So what sort of differences uh, you have found between the current workers' movement and the movement uh, that took place in initial mm. phase? There was nothing when I started. Mm. I mean, there, uh, there was uh, no trade union movement. Mm. I myself did not know what is a trade union. So I had to learn myself uh, that what is a trade union. Uh, and uh, we had to, uh, we had to uh, register workers and we did not know who to register. Mm -hmm. So we had to wait outside the factory. Let's see, okay, this guy is coming, so he looks nice guy, let's talk to him. Mm -hmm. This kind of picking up mm -hmm. each and every pieces around the country. And you no, know, somebody would say, no, I, I'm not interested, then uh, try another one. Mm -hmm. So it took 23 years to build the structure of labor union, mm -hmm. of an international standard. I mean, there's not only one sector, there's uh, 27 sectors now in my union. Mm -hmm. And in other areas, like uh, United States, it has hundreds of uh, sectors. You can not imagine what kind of sector they are, like uh, movie script writers union of the world, <laughs> they, they belong, <laughs> or comedians of the uh, screenplay, something mm. like so, so anything. Mm. The reason is you get together mm -hmm. and put your difficulties in front of the uh, management mm. and you dialogue and you resolve. And that's how it is. How like. difficult was it back then? It was difficult, uh, uh, no, at times it was uh, e easy, easy. <laughs> now because, it has become because they difficult. were scared, mm. management were scared. Mm. So when we came there, we gave them reason. Okay. okay. The reason is, if you want to satisfy your worker, give the minimum standard whatever that time the law required. Mm. And if the satisfied worker you have, you will make more money mm. because you don't have to look after the uh, pennies and um, uh, uh, cents uh, accounts mm. because all our goods are coming from outside. One cent in dollar goes up or down. I mean, your raw material will cost more or less. Mm. So you take care of the international business for your uh, supplies chain and 
and market and let us uh, help you out with the your demands mm -hmm. so we thought what is labor law what is uh, uh, trade union law how do you come together how you put demands then at times there was a strike because there was, uh, there was no understanding but i'll tell you a very interesting thing up till now I worked at that time 23 years, mm -hmm. almost six months, 23 years, six months, to establish everything. And the labor law is not 100% implemented. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tell you right now in front of the camera that how, how much percentage uh, is implemented. But very less people receive whatever the uh, labor law says. Mm -hmm. From 1991 till now, the first May is coming of this year, very soon, the demand is same, implement the labor law. Mm. That means implement the minimum wages, implement all the, uh, now there is a social protection, that means Workers pay 10% uh, employers pay 20%. What is 20% is 10% uh, provident fund, 8.33% uh, uh, gratuity, one month salary, that's uh, you get end of service, so 18.33 and 1.67% uh, is for med medical benefit and other demands, so 20%. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that about 100 or 150 or 200 companies are only registered with the Social Security Fund. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do that. Previously, they were saying that, okay, give us a solution. You come together, put up your demand, and we will solve it. Previously, they were saying that there are too many unions. Mm -hmm. Now, there's only one union, like Richard said, JTUCC. So what we are saying is, put your 20%, religiously to the social security. Register yourself. If you have 15 workers, give the name to the uh, 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 social security fund and put their money every month mm -hmm. so that you would not have to face a bulk uh, 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 um, uh, payment later in the future. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's not done. About 150,000 to 200,000 workers are only um, uh, in that scheme. Mm. Whereas in Nepal, there are a crore and 20 lakhs workers. Mm. They should all be. Can you imagine what big fund would that be if all the workers pay? So I think we have to follow the rules, mm -hmm. not only workers but the employers, employers too. as well as the government has to follow the rules too. to implement to implement the labor law yeah. so as we are talking about social security scheme so implementing social security scheme has become an uphill battle like he just figured the data ILO has provided a technical assistance to many institutions as well but many informal sector are reluctant to involve in this scheme. Mm. So what's your perspective in this? Uh, how can we involve other sectors like uh, there are sectors like mm. hotel, mm. restaurants, mm. or financial institutions, even the banks? So how can we involve them in this glorious scheme? Mm. <laughs> that's that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, I mean there's <laughs> no no I mean first of all like Luxman said, social security is something everyone wants. Mm. You know, I mean we need to know that, for example, maternity uh, coverage. We need to know if, if, if someone has a baby that they can take time off work and, and they can get the coverage they need to do that and not lose their jobs. That's really important for women and men and for companies. We need to know that we'll have health care when we get sick. And we need to know when we retire, we have some revenue. Mm. You know, now we're so busy taking care of our families and, and you know, what about later when we get old, you know, who's going to take care of it? These are things everyone wants. Even business owners want these things. So we, you know, it's common that you develop these pooled systems where workers pay a bit, employers pay a bit, and then we get these essential things that we need. And that way we can do our jobs uninterrupted. So it's a good idea. Now normally, and I, I hear your pessimism, 
But keep in mind that every country, it takes them decades to roll out social, social security system. Mm -hmm. It does. And, you know, Nepal hasn't done that bad, badly. You know, they, they're on track. Now, of course, I think there was a delay, some delays in the first year. But now I find that they're quite open to technical assistance from ILO, international organizations, mm -hmm. and, and national partners. They're listening. They're making improvements. So I, w I would foresee, I'm being optimistic, yeah, yeah. that within a year we'll see some uptick in interest from the formal sector. Now, when we say mm -hmm. formal sector, those are reasonably sized companies that register with the government, like you, you know, you work for a TV station, so it's a formal sector company. Hotels are there, banking sector. Now we have some movement there. There's been some resistance mm -hmm. from some sectors, but by addressing their concerns and making improvements in the system, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, mm -hmm. formal. Now informal economy are those that work, like if you have your own business, say you know, you're making carpets in your home with, mm -hmm. by yourself or with five other people, or if you're an agri a small-scale farmer, you know, you have nothing. You, you have the money you make that day. But if you get sick, forget it, you know. You have to go to your neighbors or your family. So there's no Social Security there. And we need it there. But that's going to take some time. This is not something where you can develop overnight. And I would say that, you know, we have a plan in place, but we don't have a detailed path. But what we need to do is really sit down again and this year, and there's willingness to work on informal economy, to, to map out a plan. But the, I would say the government needs to do more here because we don't have the employer contribution with a lot of these small scale industries and individual business owners. So we'll, we need to make some adjustments uh, to support the informal economy to enter into a social security scheme. And we plan this year to develop some pilots, some models of how this can be done, and support the government to scale this up over time. So if you look at like a country like New Zealand, I believe, it took them dec you know, decades to get their formal system mm -hmm. in place, and then moved to informal economy, it, it, you know, it took 30 years. So in Nepalese, we all need to be a little bit patient with our government. <laughs> that they'll get there, you know, it's a bit push and pull, but it, it's absolutely necessary. When we talk about uh, implementing social security scheme, mm. there's a strong narrative uh, presented by the employer. When we talk about protecting the right of the worker, it's often misunderstood as destruction of employer's right. So how can we change the, that narrative? Mm. It's not, we're not curtailing the right of employer. By, if we give rights to the worker, that doesn't mean we are curtailing the right of employer. So how do you want to put your views on this. Well, this I mean, it depends, you know, changed. rights are relative, right? You know, do I have a right as an employer for mm -hmm. you know, unlimited profit growth without taking care of the mm -hmm. people that make that possible? And I, I, I don't think that, I think employers in Nepal are fairly sophisticated, like the big companies. Mm -hmm. They realize that they have to, it's a give and take, that they have to, to a degree, implement the labor law in order to r remain productive. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if, if you're not paid enough, and the p people here in the station are not paid enough, they're not going to do their job so well. Mm -hmm. And eventually you're going to leave and go somewhere else. So there's a recognition they need to take care of their workers. And the labor law is a good guide. So I, I think in some ways employers already know. But are they doing enough? And that's where it, we really have to have the government taking a role. They have a law. They need to monitor the implementation. If companies don't comply, then they should be held accountable. So government has a role. Employers have to know the policies and, and abide by them. And workers, this is why unions are so important. They hold them accountable to deliver on Are you law. happy with the government's role here in checking the implementation part? Well, I think it's hard for governments all over the world to monitor. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many companies there are, you know, and they can't physically go. You know, there's like 20 labor inspectors in Nepal. Now, and there are thousands of companies. So, in a way... A government's role is to work through the employers' organizations, make people understand the law, and, and, and have some kind of, I don't know, there are different approaches for monitoring mm -hmm. remotely. So look at new innovative ways that low-resource country can implement and monitor labor law. It's not easy, but we're not there yet, for sure. It's an ongoing process. Yeah, and with federalism, we do need much more local presence mm -hmm. of labor offices at municipal level. And, and really to, if you don't have local solutions, mm -hmm. you'll never have the monitoring. So I think it's mobilizing resources at local level mm -hmm. in the government to, to work with private sector.
to, to, to comply with labor law. All right. Now I move on to Laxman sir. It came to my knowledge that you are the one who brought the concept and raised the voice that there should be social security for all workers. However, I feel these schemes are not available to the class of people who direly need them. Uh, these schemes are available to people, a little upper class working group, because the lower class hasn't received the appointment letter, they don't have the minimum A's. So therefore, the workers issue remains the same. In this context, what are the contribution of the labor movement? How do you see this as? No, this is to replace every animalage in, into the labor law. Mm. That uh, they wanted to flex some flexibility. Mm. Employers wanted to, some flexibility. What we said, uh, we means not only I, mm. all the unions uh, said, that give them all the benefits what is described in, in the labor law, mm -hmm. not above, up and above the labor law or outside the labor law. Mm -hmm. Everything inside the labor, we are, whenever we talk, we talk whatever is uh, agreed upon. Yeah. So give whatever is there in the labor law. And once um, uh, um, uh, they receive, then then you don't have to give the, you have the fl flexibility. But flexibility has to be um, uh, very strictly uh, implemented too. That means I work, you don't want me to work here for more than five days. So I come here, mm -hmm. work here five days, give my social security, put it in my account. Okay. Then I go to him, the other person. Mm -hmm. Then I would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So on, I change the, um, uh, change the companies all the time. Mm. I get, get some um, uh, skill here. With that skill, I go to another company. I'm a play, uh, change is always good. It change is never bad. It's mm -hmm. always good. So, more change I do in my professional career, higher I go. Mm. Okay, that's a lesson a, for me as well. Yeah, me no, too. This, <laughs> is, this is a fact. This is a fact. Yeah. More things I make, okay. higher I go. Mm. Like, like you are stepping, uh, climbing the steps. Mm. Every step makes a change. Okay. Then uh, the, the back foot... And puts you to the top as well. Uh, no, <laughs> the, the back foot is ready for the next step. Yeah. And th that's one step up. Mm. Then again up. So it's always change. So what we are saying, the employer has to agree one thing. Okay. Until and unless well-paid workers are here, mm. who is going to buy your product? Mm -mm. Look at the uh, sophisticated supermarkets. Mm. They close today one day and uh, close another day. Open one day, close another day. Because those who can afford, they are flying to Europe and uh, Singapore and Japan every th three months, uh, six months. And those who are here don't have the money. How do you think this economy is growing 30% uh, in the GDP? Mm -hmm. Because some workers are giving their lives outside Nepal and working very hard in 51, 52 degrees of heat, 18 hours a day, very precarious condition, mm -hmm. and they are sending money. This is the product of, till 1995, 96, there were only two banks, only one airline, two airlines. Now there are 31 banks, more than 100 uh, television stations, yeah. maybe 1,000 radio stations. Where does that all ad come from? From the Middle East, where workers are paying their, through their blood. Mm -hmm. So what I am saying is, employers should understand we will never go outside the labor law purview. Hmm. Never, never. That's not in our benefit. If we cross that Luxman Rekha, the fire line, hmm. we'll burn ourselves. Police will come and put us in, in the jail immediately. Lock the factory. Employer will go and uh, open another factory. But where the worker can go? Worker has no place. The worker closes the factory because they want to open it as soon as they uh, reach the negotiation. Because they do not have uh, sufficient money or fall back, fall back upon. Mm. 
for the evening meal, for the school children, uh, fees, mm -hmm. for the medical bills, uh, looking after their uh, pregnant uh, female, I mean wife, or sisters and old parents and grandmothers. No, they cannot afford to strike. They cannot afford to get money every day. They have to have money. Okay. So this, this understanding is a false narrative mm -hmm. creating um, um, uh, uh, by someone to look good. <laughs> mm. Yeah, ILO is a tripartite organization. Uh, we have a representation of uh, employee, employer and the state. Uh, ILO is often criticized that it is taking side of NGOs than the trade unions. It's mm. more, more of its program are uh, dedicated to the NGOs than the unions or the labor. How do you like to clarify in this? Is this true? <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, think, like I don't think it's the case. I think that there are sensitivities sometimes when on the rare occasions we work with NGOs, mm. uh, but our primarily, primary vehicle for collaboration in the country is with the uh, unions and the workers' organizations and also the employers' organizations mm. and the government. We, we, we work with all three. Now there are cases where we work with civil society, but to me that the civil society partnerships are a, an avenue of helping unions to expand their base. Mm. So, you know, the case, look at domestic workers. Now initially, when ILO, you know, in the governing body, you know, enacted a labor convention on domestic workers. This is, you know, household workers on their labor rights. This was very new to everyone, the trade union movement. So that they didn't really have the avenues of working with mostly women that weren't organized. So initially, the, the NGOs, the CSOs had good, good links to these women working in households. Now, they don't come together like other workers, you know, they're in the home all the time. So when do they have time to get out and organize? So civil society played a, a very important initial role, bringing them together. Mm -hmm. And then the trade unions ideally step in and get their membership and really drive uh, their, their participation in the labor union movement. So I see them as an initial step in bringing together these groups that you mentioned, these ones that are often not covered mm -hmm. because they're outside. They're in the invisible workers. They have a key role. But ultimately, to have a long-lasting, a large-scale approach with these kind of workers, the unions have to do it. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that. So it's more like an initial step pre-marketing <laughs> for trade unions. And I think unions are increasingly comfortable with working with some CSOs. That's the way. Partnerships are always important when we enter new, new kinds of work. For better goals. Right. Mm. So Lakshman sir, you are equally engaged in both Nepal's labor movement and also in the international labor movement. So how is the situation of international labor movement? Uh, it is, can you draw any comparison between international labor movement and the movement we are uh, mm. seeing here in Nepal? Yeah, um, uh, see you have to understand, all, the, all these laws, around two, uh, 205 or 6 laws uh, in the ILO, we are guided by those laws. The yeah. reflection of, because we have, or our governments or our employers mm -hmm. have gone there and, and agreed in the uh, Geneva every June, agrees. To make one law, sometimes it takes two or three, four, five years, or maybe more sometimes. Uh, because uh, dis discussions and discussions and all those things it takes. Mm -hmm. To make laws according to our uh, situation, we have to convince people that this is what we want. And they have to come to the understanding uh, that, uh, okay, this is a reality of the world now. Mm -hmm. So we have to go there and convince them that, okay, this is the law we want. But what is happening now is this is narrowing slowly, slowly narrowing mm. okay. for, for, for their own constituencies. Mm. And, the, and the union size is also narrowing because of the globe, not only globalization, but because not friendly government. Mm -hmm. 
the, the idea they want uh, 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 for worker is they have their own idea, populist uh, ideas. <laughs> they will say that I, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you the rose garden for you. <laughs> but what you get is uh, a garden with the thrones. Thorns. Thorns. Mm. That's, that's uh, what it is. Because we have seen that mm. they promise everything but don't get anything. Mm. This is why we need to have solidarity. But unfortunately, this precariousness in the, in the organized workers is going down. That means people like those who have all the benefits, mm. they, they don't want any union. They don't Un advocate anymore. Anymore. Mm. <laughs> because they are in the, in the, in the uh, AC, 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 AC room yeah, from the top. They see, okay, there is a, a strike in the, my gate, but mm. I, I have everything. So they don't, don't want. Mm. And other thing is what is happening is from the bottom, uh, the guards were your employees, AP1's employees, or cleaners were employees. Mm -hmm. Now they have all started uh, um, uh, 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 contracting out. Outsourcing. Mm. Outsourcing. Mm -hmm. Outsourcing. So the so size of union is going slow and slow and slow. It's small. Mm size of union is getting smaller. So it's shrinking. Shrinking. Mm -hmm. And it is somehow or other, uh, the new framework is social dialogue. It's called social dialogue. We have also social dialogue. In the last 10, 15 years, you must have seen the rate of strikes have gone down. down. Mm -hmm. Very All over the world, gone down. And we, we have started dialoguing. But I may be very uh, committed to the dialogue because it's my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. But from the other side, it may not be the same thing for them from the other side of the um, table. That's employed. So I draw the conclusion here, the moment it's shrinking. Not shrinking, the new collaboration. Uh, the government has become their partner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somehow or other, because mm -hmm. as Richard said, mm -hmm. they want GDP. Okay. Forget all the benefits to the individuals, like you were saying, that um, uh, uh, um, the workers should have patience. Okay, how long? Um, only 10% or 15%, um, yeah, 5% workers are getting social protection. Mm. But what about the 95%? They are waiting for the social protection. How long then can, can they wait? Because they are getting sick every day. They are, they are dying every day. So you cannot say. Either you follow the old system till you get, uh, get into the new system. Mm. But you have in, in established the new system and, and eradicated the whole uh, old system. Okay, I'll come back to you. Uh, Richard, as we are talking about the workplace, workforce, labor movement, we cannot forget COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. This is the new reality. Uh, ILO has conducted several studies uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on the labor market. Uh, please tell us more about this. What are the impacts of COVID-19 on the Nepali labor market? What does this study suggest? <laughs> That's a big one. But I, I mean, the biggest impact, I mean, of, of COVID on workers has been on those informal economy workers. So the mm -hmm. daily wage workers, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, once they stop working, they don't have anything. You know, they didn't have enough money. In the first lockdown, remember, mm -hmm. in 20, 2020, that was the biggest lesson learned that, you know, the bulk of 80% of workers are in informal economy. They have no social protection. So when you have a crisis like COVID, how do they survive? You know, that was the lesson, clearly. They had nothing. They had to go back to their villages, often by foot. Uh, they didn't have anything other than the networks in their villages to, to grow their own food and survive. So th this is unacceptable. So as the international community, you know, our role is to support the government to build a more resilient res social protection system that reaches these informal economy workers. Mm -hmm. That's really important. So who was hardest hit is where we need to prioritize our work over the next five years, learning from COVID. So, but I think for the larger enterprises, clearly setbacks, you know, look, hotels were mostly shut down. You know, what happened to those workers? I think they were paid for a while. There were negotiated solutions. Not ideal, but not as severe as the informal economy workers. So my lesson from COVID is we need to focus on the most vulnerable segments. Like you mentioned on the Social Security, 
you know, where is that reaching? Is it getting the poorest of the poor? And clearly it's not. You know, the whole notion of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development it Goals, goes, yeah. is leave no one behind. And with an approach that only focuses on economic growth and doesn't take care of the needs of the workers, at the same time, you're leaving large segments behind mm -hmm. in severe poverty. And when that happens in a country, the long-term threat to national stability is threatened. Mm -hmm. You know, when people are frustrated, that's the enemy of social solidarity in a country. And it really is a long-term threat to peace in any country. So important to focus yeah. on this. Can you elaborate more on this, the impact of COVID-19 in the international labor movement and the movement here in Nepal? Well, uh, international labor movement, uh, the countries where they had social security, the impact was less, mm. less severe, mm. like United States. Mm. They, they, they take out, took out uh, trillions of dollars in the, from the uh, treasury and distributed to the workers. Mm. And sometimes the other, other side of the um, uh, aisle, they said, you are making people lazy. Nobody wants to work because they are, they are getting too much of uh, benefits. <laughs> Without working. Without working. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, even in uh, high countries. I hear the same case in Japan. Yeah, the same, restaurant same owners. Right, okay. <laughs> They've been getting they a lot of money they without cooking afford. food and serving food. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so, you know, so, there is a labor shortage there. <laughs> so, so, what is the result? U.S. is, US is uh, recovering faster than any other country. Yeah. Faster than any other country. Mm -hmm. Now 6.87%. Uh, and the rate of uh, employment is higher. Mm -hmm. right. In Europe also they survived. But countries of the third world, I mean, they cannot uh, stand. Mm -hmm. They cannot stand. I mean, Nepal, situation in Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka is very bad, mm. very, very bad. Yesterday, someone was calling me, we cannot do anything in Sri Lanka because uh, uh, exchange rate is 200 and uh, something mm. for one dollar, which was 140, 60, something like that. It's now 200. It's, uh, and the restriction so much. So what I think is, that's where the need of the social security, social protection is coming. Mm. We have to have a fund to create mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, sustainability during when there is nothing is working. Mm -hmm. Nothing is working. What, what happens if, if, if the war expands? Mm. I don't know. I, I'm not going to name any war, but anywhere any war. There is a threat all, in all corners. There are war, war. The, everybody is talking about war, mm. but there are chances that it might trigger to the uh, world war. Let's not see uh, see that gloomy situation, mm. but we have to have something to fall back upon. Otherwise, we will be on our backs. Mm. So, uh, my suggestion is. Uh, Work, employer has to understand mm. all the benefit from the government came to the employer, nothing to the workers. Even in Nepal and India and uh, in this sub, sub region. Mm -hmm. The w workers, it cannot trickle down. The theory is you give it to uh, the um, uh, employer and it will trickle down to the um, base level. It does not work like that. Mm. It has never worked like that. It gets stuck in the midway. Okay. So now I move on to the um, migrant workers. Mm. So more than 1,200 Nepali fly to different regions, especially Gulf countries, in a normal situation for a better life. But like they, their situation is very, very poor there. They, they are under exploitation, um, working in a very, very minimum wages. Uh, people call it a modern slave. So mm. how do you take this as why ILO is unable to take any concrete step to address such sensitive and serious issues mm. for the migrant workers, especially working in Gulf countries? Do we, do we not do anything? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. no. Well, Last one is an expert on migration. No, no. ILO, ILO is doing it. Uh, it there, there are two sectors. Mm. IOM is one of the sectors, mm. which, mm. which takes place of the migration side. ILO takes the workers' uh, 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 side, the working conditions side. Mm. And now uh, Nepalese trade unions are in, in Qatar now. Mm. 
with the help of the ILO and with my organization like ITUC, uh, Singapore and Brussels, mm -hmm. they have negotiated. Last, last, uh, last yesterday I talked to the Africans, they went to Qatar. Qatar is under pressure now to relax uh, the labor law situation and expand the labor benefits. Better mm. let than never. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, no, because, because uh, um, they were doing it very slowly, mm. but now the um, uh, international, uh, pressure. Uh, international pressure. They cannot uh, stand in the international pressure uh, that, okay, if uh, they want to be international prayer, mm. they have the bigger ambition uh, to be a center of uh, East and West. Mm. You have to comply with the laws, mm. and labor law is one of the major law where uh, 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 things are looked upon, uh, that uh, whether this country is following the labor law or not. So this is uh, the situation is a little changing. Mm. Yeah. And what I would say is, ILO is trying its best, uh, but it has a limitation. Uh, so, uh, that ILO doesn't have a, a biting uh, capacity. It's, it's a suggesting, it suggests, but the government has to listen to it too. Mm -hmm. I was in the governing body for 12 years, and uh, this is what I came to know. I mean, we, 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 at times we were saying the, whatever you are saying, but ILO doesn't have a um, force to implement in any country. All it can do is negotiate with the country. Also, it can advocate and bring voice. It does advocacy mm. is, uh, is the major uh, technical assistance mm. of the ILO. That's, that's what it is built upon. It gives all the technical assistance. But you have to take the pill too. If he gives me an advice and I put it there, I mean, he cannot help me out. He cannot put the, the throat in, um, pill into my throat. He uh, doesn't have army. Isn't there any injecting mechanism? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there is. That that is that is evoking uh, uh, Article Thirty. Mm. Okay. Article Thirty, and you can imagine it has a repercussion. Mm. It has a big repercussion, like what is happening in 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 uh, other countries. Mm. I don't want to name any country here, but it's it it has a bigger repercussion. Mm. You are isolated from the world uh, business scenario. Mm. You, 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 you do not have the capacity to do business. So ILO doesn't want to do that. It's not uh, that level of organization. It is a technical assistance to the, uh, they have experts on everything. Okay, so yeah. we cannot deny the fact that there are lots of issues with migrant workers. So what are the initiatives and plans of SIRTUC for the workers' uh, decent work and also uh, preserving their human rights? So th this is, uh, yesterday uh, also we were talking, uh, I, I was asked by some group in Africa and other to give the lecture on so, uh, portability of the social security. Mm. This is what we are trying to do. Now the next uh, question is, mm. there is the Abu Dhabi dialogue between uh, GCC countries and Asian, Asian um, uh, country of origin. Mm -hmm. And we want to tell our governments that, okay, take this uh, proposition and uh, discuss in Abu Dhabi dialogue. But my government cannot take it until the whole uh, uh, nations agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are, there are a lot of uh, complex, I mean, it's like uh, pushing a big ship with a small uh, strength. You cannot do that. We have to push 15, 15 countries of origin. Philippines, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, all these countries has to agree to discuss social protection, minimum wages and uh, implementation of labor law with the, with the um, country of uh, destination. Okay. And I fear that if I become too harsh on negotiation, then uh, the, the country of uh, destination might go to my competitors. Okay, it mm. will have a reverse effect. Right. Effect. Okay. So I cannot m m very hardly, mm. and we do not agree into one subject. Mm. But at the same time, we try to uh, take the uh, group together, mm. okay. but uh, not uh, successfully implemented. So it's there's a very, very uh, thin uh, line cast, between cast, protecting cast the right and destroying and the work the, opportunity. The opportunity. Yeah. 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 If I uh, if I take a very strong stance, mm. then they will say, okay, this is Lakshman Bastet who is spoiling uh, the, the migrant working workers, environment. workers' environment yeah. to uh, go to um, uh, country right. of destination. All right, I've almost. 
come to an end. Yes. I'm all set to wrap today's discussion. I'd like to know from Richard, last remarks. What are your suggestions to raise the living standard of working class Nepali people and to organize trade union movement in Nepal? What are your suggestions? Well, the trade union movement, I leave it to the experts, but I think to address some of these fundamental challenges on migration, for example, we know that migration is the opportunities are reducing in GCC and mm -hmm. in, in the Gulf countries. Uh, it's heavily construction and those jobs are, will, will reduce over the next three or four years. So we'll reduction in migration opportunities, which will lead to a reduction of remittances in the country, which is a very important part of the economy. Mm -hmm. So it's critical that the government, private sector, look for new opportunities, new markets, new within new countries in, in Europe, Eastern Europe, China, wherever we can see new migration markets. And I think that's possible. We need good bilateral agreements between countries that specify the labor rights, but also to skill these workers, give them the skills they need to cap capture these better opportunities in newer markets. Migration. On, on job creation, we know there are not enough jobs for young people, half a million people entering the market every year. Mm -hmm. We need to create jobs at home. So it's several things that's very important. We need to address working conditions, but we need foreign direct investment. It's not all going to be homegrown investment to make Nepal grow. So we need to open up our minds and our markets for foreign companies to participate. That will create jobs and create growth. We need to support small and medium enterprises in a different way. They have so many challenges to start businesses in the country. And, and we need to eliminate those challenges, but do so again in a way that also addresses workers' concerns at the same time as they grow. So creating jobs is critical. So ILO is very much emphasizing this in our work in the, in the, in the years ahead. Probably the last remark. What should be done to ensure the trade union's right and to strengthen the trade union movement? Well, this is a, this is a very, very uh, uh, difficult, uh, uh, what can we do? We did a lot of things in 25 years, uh, 20, almost 30 years. Mm. And uh, I think uh, we have to collaborate with the employer. That's the, that's the only way. And they have to come to the table and discuss. Mm. And uh, give uh, uh, training, uh, uh, education to the workers. It has to expand. Mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, um, I mean, uh, um, we cannot uh, uh, just uh, fight. Mm. There's, we don't have the time to fight. And, and the young people are getting desperate. Now, in few 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 years time, they, they won't. They may not find any worker here in Nepal, because uh, we don't see it. So keep it, keep them here for national economy is most important. Mm. We have to give them um, uh, um, uh, some education. I'll tell you one thing. At the end of uh, and at, at the end of my sister, my tenure mm. after twenty three years. I went to a field visit. I used to go, mm -hmm. and in one of the uh, tea gardens, uh, belongs to the uh, royal families. We were talking to them. Do, do you think we did enough for you to to um, uh, be proud of a trade union? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, what we did? Do you, are you satisfied with us? That worker said, "No, no, I am very satisfied." What? Trade unions did, they gave respect to the mm. worker. They brought from, from uh, uh, field to the negotiating table. And the other side was the employer, which we had never thought of mm. negotiating with the employer in this way. Mm. Now, this process has to go further. Further in the mean, I am in a process that employer is siding with the government. Should we be involved in the politics also? So that to implement our labor laws, to implement our um, um, higher skills, to implement uh, uh, for education, it, it, this idea comes into everybody's mind mm. that uh, die, let's go and fight election. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we are finished. Mm. Because uh, uh, employers are not... Uh, uh, in the pretext of social dialogue, 
I mean, there is no dialogue between uh, workers and uh, employers. And the government doesn't bring, uh, create the atmosphere of a dialogue. Mm. So the whole system has to be changed for a while. Co cooperation, co mm. collaboration, co not only uh, participation. Our, we have to be on the table too. The, not me means uh, Lakshman Bastard, not Lakshman mm. Workers have to be on the table. Mm. No talk in 30 years in parliament for the job creation. Mm. What do you need for job creation? There is no discussion in the parliament. No discussion in the cabinet. So how can you discuss the, 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 the whole country is just uh, uh, set for sending people out. So that the less trouble in the country. This is what it looks like. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time Thank and you. extraordinary remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for letting us. I don't know uh, if we could satisfy the audience, uh, but this is what I, we feel about Thank it. Thank you. It was indeed a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. With this, we've come to an end of NTUC's dialogue. We'll see you next week. Have a great time ahead. Bye-bye. An AP1 presentation.